sing one and uh, I'm thankful for the Bible I love my Bible and I love my Savior and so you guys come over here can we get these can we hold these mics or set them down there we go that's fine <laughs> I want to sing this song this morning because it's going to go along with my message. But uh, we just got it here. Let's see here. Let's see if we have the microphones. Sing out and sing to the Lord. This is a song to the Lord. And I tell I tell the kids all the time, I said, listen, when we're singing, we're not singing for you. We're not singing for them. We're singing for him. And we're singing to him. And so uh, this song makes it easy because this song is addressed to the Lord. And uh, the title of this song is, I Love You, Lord.
Amen. Well, the pastor asked if I'd tell a little bit about our ministry before I get into the message. And uh, so I'm going to take a few minutes and tell you about the ministry. Turn to Mark chapter 1, if you will. And then uh, after uh, I'll tell you about the ministry a little bit and present our burden, then I'll have the family come back up. We'll sing one more song before the message. And so Mark chapter 1. Give a little of our history. Uh, <clears throat> my wife and I have been married 25 years, and uh, God's blessed us with 11 children, and uh, we're thankful for that. And uh, we've been in ministry for um, about uh, about 17 years, I guess it would be somewhere, or 15 years, somewhere around there. I haven't counted, but. Um, in 2010, really that's when we started full-time ministry, so it was about 13 years. I began pastoring in Nova Scotia, Canada. I pastored there for about seven years. And then God called us into evangelism in, uh, in June of 2017. And so for the last uh, six years, we've been traveling wherever the Lord opens the door. We go and we preach the gospel and sing the gospel and try to live the gospel. And, uh, and try to help churches reach their Jerusalem uh, with the gospel of the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, last fall, the Lord really began working in my heart. And I didn't know exactly what he was doing, but uh, there was an unsettledness uh, about our ministry. And so I began praying. I just started praying, Lord, whatever you want us to do, uh, we're willing to do that, and God just kept burdening my heart and uh, making me uncomfortable. And sometimes he has to get us out of our comfort zone before we'll obey him. Right. And, um, and so I was praying, and, and uh, so eventually I got to a place in my life where I just said, Lord, I'm going to take everything off the table. Everything that, I, that, I, that I'm doing, everything that I've, uh, that I've been I'm just going to wipe the slate clean between me and you, and you put back on the table what you want me to do. And so God began stirring in my heart for our home province. Our home is New Brunswick, Canada. And uh, how many of you know where New Brunswick is? Just a couple people, my family, a couple others. So there's a fellow Canadian over here. She knows where it's at because she learned it in school. Is that right? Okay. Um, uh, New Brunswick is a, is a small province to the east of Maine. So you go up uh, to Maine and you run out of the U.S. and you run into New Brunswick. And um, <clears throat> we have uh, around uh, not quite 900,000 people in our province. Um, to my knowledge, there's only five or six uh, Bible-believing churches in the entire province. And so uh, the, in size, uh, it's about the size of, uh, uh, land-wise, about the size of South Carolina, West Virginia, about that size. Um, and uh, I know in, in the state of South Carolina alone, um, uh, there, are, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of Bible-believing churches. And we have, we have five. We, uh, our home church is First Bible Baptist Church of Quispamsis, New Brunswick, Canada. And, um, and uh, our church on a good Sunday when we're home, and we have, you know, we have 12 now, 12 of us uh, at home. When we're home, we'll have about 60 people on a good Sunday. That's the largest independent Baptist church in the province of New Brunswick. So uh, it's not a big church, but little is much when God is in it. Amen. Amen. And so the need is great, and God began moving in my heart about, uh, about our province, and God brought me to this verse right here, and I want to read it to you. Uh, the story here, Jesus, he's been in Capernaum. He's, done, uh, uh, he's been in the synagogue there. He cast out uh, uh, unclean spirits from a man. He goes to Simon's house. He heals his mother-in-law, and uh, I guess that's a blessing. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a blessing. Amen. Amen. Um, and then people just start flocking to him. 
they start flocking to him, and, and uh, we read in this passage in verse number 37, it says, And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. So Jesus is drawing a crowd because he's doing mighty works. And uh, people want to see him. They want to hear from him. And verse 38, uh, the Lord really spoke to my heart in verse 38 where he says, And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. And uh, Jesus' life, his ministry, you study out his ministry about uh, what I'm told, those who've researched it, about 85% of his ministry was, was uh, done in about a 12-mile triangle. So most of his work was done at Capernaum, Bethsaida, uh, Corazon. He mentions these three by name as doing many mighty works there. Matthew chapter 11, he talks about that. So the majority of his work was in this little 12-mile triangle, and yet there were times that God led him beyond his normal route to a place that was in need. And uh, here he makes this statement, and just to go through the statement here, he says, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. He gives four statements here. The first thing is let us go. And, uh, and, and Jesus is saying, uh, I want your participation in this. Now, Jesus could have done it all himself. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Nothing's too hard for him. And yet he invited his disciples to go with him to preach the gospel, to reach the lost. That's what the Lord's doing with us. Yeah. Not just me and my family, but you as well. Yeah. Let us go. Let's go. Let's not keep the seed in the barn. Let's not keep the message of the gospel to ourselves. Let's go. And so he, he, there's participation here. But also I'm thankful that he's not saying, you go, and I'll stay here. <laughs> I'm glad he says, let us go. So wherever you go with the message of the gospel, you can be assured that the Lord is with you. Yeah. And, uh, and so he's got that. And then he says, into the next towns, he's got a plan. And... Uh, uh, when you go out to reach your community, you ought to have a plan. And, uh, and we have a plan to reach our, our province with the gospel, and I'll outline that in just a minute. But his, pl his plan was, was uh, prayer-based. It was, it was born out of prayer. You see that in verse 35. In the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Amen. And so he prayed. And listen, everything that we do for the Lord has to be bathed in prayer because that's when we're going to get, God's going to reveal to us the plan that he has for us uh, to get the gospel out. There's participation, there's a plan. And then he says this, that I may preach there also. The power of the gospel is through the preaching of his word. Nothing replaces the preaching of the word of God. And, uh, and that's the plan uh, that we have is to go and preach the gospel. And then he gives the purpose. He says, for therefore came I forth. Um, if the Lord wanted to, he could have just saved us and taken us to heaven right off. But he, he did not, and that's because he has a purpose for us. Yeah. And that purpose is to preach the glorious gospel to a lost and dying world, to shine the light in a dark place. Yeah. And so what the Lord brought me to this passage, and as I was uh, focusing on this passage a little bit, the Lord began dealing with my heart about our province. And uh, when, he, when I came across this, this phrase, let us go into the next towns, um, I thought about all the towns and all the communities in our province that have no gospel witness. And there's many of them, no gospel witness at all. Um, there, there's, uh, 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 there's religion, but there's no gospel. And as we mentioned, I think, Friday night, there's another Jesus that's being preached by most churches today. There's another gospel that's being preached. There's, there's another Bible. And we were talking on the way in this morning after uh, uh, handing out tracts and door knocking. We, uh, we're, he was talking about two Babylons and how there's only two religions. And uh, there's only two Bibles. There's God's Bible and then the devil's Bible. And the devil's Bible has all these different translations to try to confuse you. But God's not the author of confusion. Nope. 
right? right. And so there's, there's a lot of religion in New Brunswick, um, uh, but, there, but it's another Jesus, it's another gospel, it's another Bible. And so our, our desire is to go into every community in our province and preach in every community. And so um, there's, uh, they just recalibrated our communities they, just the first of the year. They, they, there's a lot of these amalgamations where a lot of communities came together to make one. And so I haven't got the, the, uh, the latest numbers on our communities uh, total, but there's around 100 um, incorporated communities in our province. So it, it's, it's just, it's a rural place, okay? You have to drive a long way to get to some of these communities. And, um, and our desire, our goal is to preach, to hold a gospel rally, gospel campaign in every one of our communities. And so uh, our plan is to, uh, some will be a week long, where we'll go and we'll send out mailers ahead, we'll put out flyers, we'll knock doors, we'll, we'll pass out John and Romans, uh, throughout the week, Monday through Friday, and then Friday night have a gospel rally uh, in a community center or whatever venue we can arrange for and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, I think uh, Pastor and I were talking about this yesterday. In a lot of ways, I think we've gotten away from the biblical program, the biblical, biblical plan of church planning. Jesus sent his disciples out. He said, you go out, you go into a town, you preach the gospel. And if they receive you, stay there. And if they don't, shake the dust off your feet, go to the next town. Keep preaching. And um, and, and the book of Acts, you see the Apostle Paul. He'd go into a town, he'd just start preaching. And people got saved, a church would start. And so that's our, that we're just going to try to do it the Bible way and see what God does. And uh, someone said, well, what if, what if uh, a bunch of people get saved and, and uh, they want to have a church? What are you going to do? Well, they're going to have a church. A saved group of people is a church. So they'll have a church, and God, it'll, it'll be God's church, and he'll take care of it. And if God says, I want you to stay and pastor this church, I'll do it. Amen? But God may raise up someone else. God may raise up someone within their own community. I think a lot of times we, you know, we want to figure out how to raise a teenager before we have a child. And let's just be faithful with what we have, and God will... Uh, provide and so uh, uh, some of the bigger communities uh, we're going to have month-long campaign and we'll uh, do uh, uh, mailers and door knocking and John and Romans and then at the end of the month we'll preach the whole week we'll have uh, preaching services Monday through Friday and so it's a big plan it's a big goal um, uh, there's just a few of us but again little as much when God is in it and uh, it's probably going to take us at least five years, maybe up to ten years, before we can reach every community. Uh, but I believe it's a goal worth uh, worth working toward. Amen. And so pray for us. we got prayer cards over here. Pick up a prayer card, pray for us, and uh, we'd appreciate that. And pray that God will uh, will uh, send in the support that we need. As evangelists, we've just, you know, we just uh, live by the meetings that we go to, and uh, and God has provided for us. But we're going to be using our summers, clearing our schedule for the summer, and spending our summers up there preaching. Amen. And so um, I pray that God will send in what we need to, to get that accomplished. And uh, we appreciate that very much. And thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to share that burden. Does anybody have any questions for while the family comes up? Anybody have any questions about the, the ministry, the goal? Uh, I, I kind of got a little involved in the preaching part and I don't know if I may have missed some some of the details but we'll continue to travel in evangelism in the spring and in the fall uh, doing revival meetings and and conferences and things and then in the summer we'll be up there preaching uh, in those communities with those gospel campaigns so I appreciate your prayers for us all right let's sing Jesus the one and only It's all about him. Amen. It's all about him. Who 
Jesus born, Son of God, yet Son of Man, who laid down his life, but rose to live again, who rides the clouds of glory, whose kingdom never ends. There is no And uh, we'll get message number two here. <laughs> I do want to thank you once again for allowing us to be here. And we've enjoyed worshiping with you in these days and learning with you. And uh, the Lord, uh, the Lord is, he's a, he's a great teacher. And if you think you've got it all figured out, you can be sure you don't. Amen. And I have learned this week, and I trust that you have as well. And we're going <clears> to <throat> ask a question. I had the kids sing that song this morning, I Love You, Lord, um, because I, I want to bring a thought to you this morning, and it's another question. We asked a question last night, what, what moves you? Uh, but... Uh, Today, for just a little while, I want to ask this question. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? And if you're like me, probably what your, your answer is yes, and I want to love him more. I, I do love him, but I want to love him more than I do love him. And, um, and so uh, just a, a few scriptures I want to look at today with you. John chapter 14 and uh, verse number 15, John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus with a very powerful statement here. This is what he says. If ye love me, 
keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. just want to look at a few things here to answer this question so we can honestly answer this question. Do we love Jesus? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your love. Thank you, God, for your word. And Lord, what we've enjoyed as we've sung the hymns and, and the spiritual songs, we've tried to lift up your son and we've tried to encourage ourselves to draw nearer to you, to love you in a greater way. We know, Lord, that if we love you, we'll keep your commandments. We know, Lord, that to love you is the greatest commandment of all. And Father, I have learned that a love, a fervent love for, for Jesus will keep me from sin and from getting, getting distracted by the things of this world. And so, God, I pray that you would help us as we ask ourselves this question and as we look at the proofs of whether we love you. God, I pray that we would search our hearts, search our lives, and see where you fit in our lives. And, Lord, if there's anything between you and us, if there's anything that takes first place in our lives other than you, God, I pray that we would repent and get back to a right relationship with you. God, thank you for all that you've done. Again, Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. God, I pray that you'd be pleased now with our time together in your word and our response to it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Jesus makes a very pointed, very simple statement here. He's talking to his disciples, and the setting is Jesus is preparing them He's getting ready to leave. He tells them in verse uh, number 1 of chapter 14, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. But we understand Jesus is trying to reassure his disciples. He's telling them, I'm going away, I'm going to come back, and I just want you to, to wait for me. I want you to work for me. Uh, there's some things I want to do through you. Uh, in the meantime, until I come back for you and receive you unto myself. And he tells them, listen, the key to your continued obedience to my word and to my plan and my will, the key to it is going to be your love for me. Now listen, we understand in the, in the book of Revelation, when Jesus speaks to the churches, that very first church that he speaks to is the church at Ephesus, and the church at Ephesus had their doctrine straight, Right? And they had the, their works were uh, uh, were uh, uh, very commendable. The Lord commends them for their works that they had done. There's a lot of things that Ephesus had right. However, the Lord had somewhat against them because they had left their first love. Yep. Listen, I, I believe in these days one of the one of the great challenges for the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to uh, get back to the place where we love the Lord like we loved Him when we first got saved. Amen. And I always enjoy, uh, thank you, Caitlin, I always enjoy uh, meeting new converts because their love for the Lord is still fresh. Amen. And uh, listen, the more we learn about Him, the more we should love Him. Right. And as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, it ought to thrill our hearts that He would love us, that He would die for us, that He would bless us with all spiritual blessings, that He would prepare a place for us. It ought to thrill our hearts and move our hearts in a greater love to the Lord Jesus Christ than ever before. Amen. And here, listen, when you love someone, you go about trying to let them know to show them how much you do love them. Yep. And uh, gentlemen, we know how important it is to remember anniversaries. That's right. Right? Amen. Amen. And uh, and uh, you don't you don't want to forget that. 
And you say, well, I mean, I, I love her whether I remember it or not. Well, I know that, but she wants to be shown that you love her, yeah. right? Yeah. Get the chocolates, get the flowers, get whatever it takes. <laughs> because you, you want to demonstrate to her that you love her. Our children, we need to demonstrate to them that we love them. And Jesus, he's saying, listen, you say that you love me. The, the first phrase of the verse, it says, if ye love me. You know what he's saying? He's inferring here, you say that you love me. Well, where is the proof of that love? Well, the first thing he mentions is keeping his commandments. Now, I think a lot of times we do ourselves a disservice as Bible believers. We look at the Old Testament and we think that Old Testament is filled with commandments and the New Testament is not. However, the, the New Testament, there are commandments in the New Testament as well as the Old. Yeah, that's right. You're right. And, and God has not changed. Nope. Yeah, you're right. He's still the same. And, and that law that we look to and we say, well, thank God we're not under the law. Let's remember that that law is, is simply a manifestation of the character of God. When you look at the law, what you're seeing is how holy God is. And we're, we're, he was giving his people a view uh, into, into his character and who he is. He's holy and he's just and he's righteous. And that's why we should live according to these laws, because it honors the character of God. And so God's character has not changed. Even though we are not under that law and we're not, we're not bound to that law, thank God Christ has made us free from the curse of the law, still we understand that in keeping the commandments, we prove to the Lord that we love him. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he says here. If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. He's going to say this again. He's going to say it down in verse 21. He says this, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. That's, pretty, that's a pretty direct and clear statement. Is that right? Yeah. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. There's blessings to those who love him. There are blessings to those who keep his commandments. Now, 1 John tells us that his commandments are not grievous. Listen, if you love someone, it's not a chore to show them that you love them. I can't believe it. I got to wake up this morning. I got to love my wife and I got to love my kids. Oh, what a burden to bear. No, if you love them, it's not grievous to show them that you love them. No, it thrills your heart. I love Christmas morning. Now, I don't know if you do Christmas or not, but I love it. I love giving my kids gifts. Yeah. I do. Uh, their birthday, I love giving them gifts. And uh, you know why? Because I love, to, I love to make them happy. I love to see the smile on their face. And, uh, and the Lord's no, he's no different. The Bible says that it's his good pleasure to give unto us the kingdom. Is that right? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Look in, uh, look in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I think I just killed the spirit there. <laughs> 1 John chapter 4. And look at verse number uh, look at verse number 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. The Bible says this, beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Yeah. So he said, listen, not only do we show the, our love for God by keeping his commandments, but we also show our love for God by loving one another. Yeah. Amen. And this is going to be something that he'll develop, will develop here in just a little while. Look at verse number 20, 1 John uh, 4, verse 20. Look what it says. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother... He is a liar. Well, that's strong language, isn't it? For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? You know what he's saying? Listen, listen, you say you love God, 
but you're going to prove you love God by keeping my commandments, number one. And number two, you're going to prove your love for God by loving one another. If you don't love, uh, listen, if you don't love your neighbor, then you're a liar. If you don't love your brother, then you don't love God. That's what the book says. And so he says, uh, uh, do you really love me? Keep my commandments. Love the brethren. Look at, uh, look at John chapter 21. John chapter 21. John 21, look at verse number 12. John chapter 21, verse 12. The story here, you know, as you turn there, the disciples have, <clears throat> they have uh, gone to the Sea of Tiberias, waiting for the Lord to meet them there. He, he had instructed them to, to uh, meet him there, and they got impatient. We kind of talked about that a little bit last night in a different story. And so Simon Peter says, I'm going fishing. And so they, they say, we're going with you. They go out, they catch nothing. Jesus calls to them, hey, children, have you any meat? No, we don't have any. Cast your net on the other side. And the Lord fills it up. And as soon as he filled the net, they understood it's the Lord. Because they remember the last time he'd done that. And now they're there on the shore. He calls them to the shore. And Jesus says in verse 12, Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Now watch this. Jesus then cometh, taketh bread, giveth them, and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. Watch this. Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? Now, you know what I've found out about believers? Sometimes, if you question their love for God, they get grieved. They get downright offended. I remember years ago I was pastoring, and... Uh, this lady got out of church and got sideways with God and with her family. And so Rachel and I went to go visit her and try to talk some sense into her. And, uh, and we got to the house, and, uh, and she let us in, and I was thankful for that. And so we get into the house, and we sit down, and, and I'm just a young preacher. I'm a young pastor. I don't know where to start, so I just start at the beginning. So, uh, so you're saved, right? Are you saved? Oh, my, that was the wrong question to ask. I had no idea. I asked her if she was saved, and she said, How dare you? You don't think I'm saved? And I said, and I said to myself, Well, when I came here, I thought you were. <laughs> now I'm not so sure. <laughs> but she was upset. How could you... How could you question whether I'm saved or whether I, I know the Lord? You know, people get that way when you question their love for God. Of course I love God. Of course I love Jesus. Peter was asked this question three times by the Lord. Do you love me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And he says the second time, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. The third time, and now Peter's grieved, and he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. You know what he's saying? You say that you love me. The proof of your love is whether you're going to invest in my people. Are you going to feed my sheep? Now, we know that Peter, the position he was given 
as a leader, it was going to be his responsibility to spiritually feed the people of God from the Word of God. He deals with that in 1 Peter chapter 5. And he exhorts the elders to feed the flock of God that's among you. I think Peter learned his lesson, amen? He learned that in order to show love to God, he was going to have to feed the sheep of God. You know, there's a lot of hirelings out there. They're standing in pulpits today to earn a paycheck, not to feed the sheep. They're there. It's all self-interest. It's all what they can get. And uh, maybe it's about status and, and looking good in front of people. It's pride. It's this. It's that. But listen, every, every person that stands up to open the Word of God, ought to, it ought to be in our hearts. The greatest desire that we have is to show love to God by feeding the sheep. Amen. And they don't need our opinions. They need the Bible. And so he says, uh, you, you can show your love to me, the proof of your love, if you keep my commandments. If you love one another, you feed the sheep. Let me give you one more. Look in John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Everybody doing okay? John chapter 19. <clears throat> and this is something that, uh, really, this is where I was, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get to. We just got a few minutes left. I don't know if I got the voice to go as long as I need, but <laughs> we'll try to give you what God's given us here. In John chapter 19, look at, <clears throat> look at verse number 38. After this, after what? After Jesus died. Mm -hmm. This is Jesus' death right here. After this... Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher wherein never man yet, uh, wherein was never yet man laid. Then uh, there laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. This is the story here of Joseph's, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They're coming to care for the body of Jesus after his death. And look, look over in Mark chapter 15. I want, to look, I want you to see this, uh, this cross-reference here and the word that's used here when they, when they uh, uh, ask to, uh, to care for the body of Jesus. Mark chapter 15, you say, what does this have to do with the message? It won't get there, just, just hang on. We're getting there. Mark chapter 15, look at verse 42. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate, and what? Craved the body of Jesus. That's an interesting word to me. He craved the body of Jesus. I looked up that word craved. It means this. Asked, asked for with earnestness. It is implored, entreated. Here's this word, longed for. So G Joseph comes to Pilate after Jesus' death, and Jesus is still up on that cross, and he, he comes to Pilate to ask if he can care for the body of Jesus. Why? Because he is craving to care for the body of Jesus. Say, so what, what are you talking about? Where, where are you going here? Look at, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1. 
Look at Ephesians chapter 1. You know why Joseph craved the body of Jesus? Because he loved him. Right? Jesus was a loved one to Joseph and to Nicodemus. He loved him. He wanted to care for him. He wanted to honor him by caring for his body. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 22. Speaking of Christ here, it says, And hath put all things under his feet, uh, uh, God exalting Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is, what? His body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. And we know this to be true. We're Bible believers. We understand the scripture teaches that the church is the body of Christ. Is that right? And what a picture we see in Joseph's life. Joseph, when he, listen, when he collected the body of Jesus, the Bible talks about his death his visage being marred more than any other man. He was so beaten and bruised and bloodied, his body was torn apart. What he went through, the body of Jesus was decimated. There's no beauty that we should desire him. We were, we were dry on the way here. And this is a, a kind of a lame illustration, but it's, it's the one that comes into my mind. On the way here, we're driving down the road. And in the middle of the road is this deer that has been struck by a car. And I've seen, you see deer on the side of the road all the time. This one was just mangled. I mean, something had got it good. It was just mangled, and there were pieces everywhere. It was a mess. You know what the, the reaction of us is to... That, we want to get away from that. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. The natural reaction to a corpse is to not be near it, especially in that kind of condition. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. What would make Joseph crave the body of Jesus? It was not that the body of Jesus was in such good shape. It was mangled. It was a mess. It was destroyed. It was cut up. It was torn apart. People had just been attacking it and throwing everything they could at it to try to destroy that body and mangle it and tear it apart. Listen, that's what our Savior went through for us. Amen. And yet Joseph approaches that body and cares for that body as if it was a newborn baby in its preciousness and carefulness and just taking care of it. Why? Because Joseph loved Jesus. Amen. And he showed his love for Jesus by caring for his body. Amen. You know what they did with that body? They anointed that body. When you look at that body and say, what... What good is anointing going to do on this body? How could this, how could us pouring this precious ointment into this body help anything? The only thing we're doing is wasting this ointment. That's what Judas thought. Is that right? Before Jesus even died. And, and Mary poured that ointment upon Jesus and Judas said, why was this waste of the ointment made? It's being wasted on Jesus' body. Why are you wasting it? We could have sold that. You know why? Mary poured that precious ointment upon Jesus. She loved him. And she wanted everybody to know that she loved him. Yep. Say, so what does this have to do with the message? Listen, you want to prove that you love the Lord? Love his body. Love his body. The body's a mess. 
Come on. It is a mess. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ, by and large, we have so gotten away from biblical Christianity, it's, in many ways, it's not even recognizable anymore. It doesn't even look like Jesus on so many levels. And before we start pointing fingers, let's look in the mirror. How much does my life resemble Jesus? There's so much in my life that, that is just a mess. And, and that's, what, that's what we're dealing with. Does that mean that the, the natural reaction is to push away? Right? It's a mess. We don't want to get near it. Yeah, but it's still Christ's body. Yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, it's been torn up. And yes, seemingly, there's nothing that that body can offer us. I get so tired of people coming, and they, want, they look up a church to see what the church will offer them. Well, do you, do you have something for the kids, and do you have something for the seniors, and do you have programs, and do you have this, and do you have that? And they're looking for the church to offer them stuff. It's all about me. It's all about what the church can do for me. Listen, what about what you can do for the church? Amen. Why? What's so important about the church? It's Christ's body. Amen. And so it's worth pouring in the precious ointment. Yes. It's worth giving your best. It's worth giving up your tomb, your future home, your priceless possessions. Come on. Amen. It's worth giving up your identity. And all of a sudden now, listen, Joseph, before he followed Jesus secretly, no more. Hey, whatever happened to the body of Jesus? Did, you didn't hear? Joseph, Joseph, the member of the Sanhedrin, Joseph collected that body. Joseph cared for his body and Joseph put him in his own tomb. Now, the body's a mess. Yeah, but it's still loved. Listen, don't count out the body just yet. <laughs> you know, that body of Jesus, it was dead. It was as dead as dead can get. It was mangled, torn up, and destroyed, and yet we know the story. Three days later, that body was back up. <laughs> it wasn't just a spiritual resurrection. It was a bodily resurrection. And as, and as ugly and as nasty as the body of Christ can get at times, there's going to come a day when he's going to raise up this body to be his bride and we're going to be perfect and beautiful Amen. and spotless Amen. and there'll be no uh, blemish in us. Yes. Right. Don't give up on the body of Christ. Amen. You know what Paul said in Romans 1? He said, I long for you. He's talking, who's he talking to? The body of Christ. He says it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 26. He talks about Epaphras. He said he longed after you. In chapter 4 of Philippians, verse 1, Paul says, My dearly beloved, and longed for. You know what he had? He had a desire. He had a love for the body of Christ. You know, it's amazing to me. You can travel the world over. You find somebody that loves Jesus. And you love them. Isn't that amazing? We've spent the last three days together. Some of you, some of you's been two, some of you just today. And you know what? I love you already. How could that be? Well, if you're saved, you're part of the body of Christ. Would you say? that the ointment they poured into Jesus' body 
and the care that, that Joseph took of his body, how they took care of that body and laid it in that grave, that tomb, so reverently, so carefully. Would you say they wasted their time or they wasted their effort or they wasted their resources? Not at all. Maybe to those on the outside looking in, they probably thought, what a waste. The Judases will always say, what a waste. You go down there and give, and give an offering to a church. Man, there's other things. You can pay bills with that. That would probably be a better use of that money. You ought to pay your bills. But listen, if you lay up treasures in heaven, they're going to last forever. How do you lay up treasures in heaven? You care for the body of Christ. Jesus says, do you love me? Keep my commandments. That's first. And he says, do you love me? Do you love me? Care for the body. Take care of the body of Christ. Feed my sheep. See, when you get saved, no man liveth to himself, no man dieth to himself. When you, when you get saved and you join the body of Christ, you have a responsibility to care for one another, love one another, pray for one another. Yep. You pray for the people in this room. You ought to pray for them. You ought to invest in them. You ought to bear their burdens. You ought to know what's going on in their life that's a burden in their life. You ought to know it. You should know it so you can help them bear that burden. Why? You're all part of the same body. I was thinking about 1 Corinthians 12 and about, you know, the, the less comely members are more needful. You ever seen a human heart? It don't look like what we draw it to be. Kids make a heart, it's so cute and lovely. Man, a human heart, that's an ugly thing right there. Ugly. Can't live without it, though. Is that right? Intestines? Oh. Say, preacher, we're about to eat. Please stop. Now listen. We need each other. We need each other. 